Hi there, welcome to another video from the Vickers MG Collection and Research Association. This time it's another one of our mannequin videos where we take a closer look at the equipment that machine gunners would have worn when using the Vickers MG. And this is one of my particularly most interesting periods of the Vickers MG use, post-1960. That period when the general purpose machine gun had already been introduced, the world was moving forward into the Cold War, yet the Vickers would remain officially in service until 1968. It was retired from frontline service in 1962, yet remained on with Territorial Army battalions and some of the British Army's training units around the world, uh, to some extent still into the 1970s in that role, particularly in the Middle East. And the Royal Marines would carry on using it until the mid-1970s as well in their deployments in the Middle East and the Far East. So this has got a really interesting sort of very late uh, use of equipment. And it's, it's one of my particular interests because I, I picked up this book a few years ago, British Army Vehicles and Equipment. It's a 1968 publication. On the rear is a picture of the Vickers machine gun. And inside it's got all of the latest equipment as well. Yet it one of the captions to the photos is that the Vickers probably the most indispensable weapon of the century. Uh, and, and, and that's quite fascinating to see it alongside, um, you know, armoured cars that were going into service in that period. There's also tactical nuclear weapons in here uh, and, and, and some of the sort of, very, you know, kit that was only just in service at that point. Nuclear, biological, chemical warfare equipment, um, you know, the, the, the different recoilless anti-tank weapons, guided weapons are in here as well. You know, proper sort of, um, you know very modern equipment compared with the machine gun that had been introduced in 1912. So a really fascinating period. And having having this late service uh, equipment, there's very few photos of the Vickers in service at that point. But again, some of those are our favourite, are our favourites here. And you know, see, seeing it in this late service is a real sort of um, mind-blowing and quite a lot of comments when people do visit the collection are focused on this equipment partly because it's the items that they remember the 1958 pattern web equipment uh, the, the standard sort of cotton um, combat jacket and trousers as well DMS boots all of those things but predominantly the the, the highlight of the weapons and what you'll see is that we have the mannequin set up with a sterling submachine gun uh, on it because by the book, that's what machine gunners should have been carrying at that point. But we learned from visits a, a, a while ago that irrespective of that, they were normally armed with the self-loading rifle. And obviously a lot of people are very fond thinking of the self-loading rifle. And this is one of sadly the deactivated weapons that we do have in the collection. Um, perhaps we'll explain the nuances of how we can have firing Vickers, but we can't have firing uh, SLRs at some point. But the yeah, we've got the SLR here. And yeah, we've been told from various National Service veterans uh, that have attended that you know, despite Sterling's being what they should have carried and what they carried in training, once they got to battalion, they were just given the SLR and expected to carry it. Uh, what the, you know, most of the time though, it was left on the Land Rovers. And one of the things that we also learned from that is uh, things like, you know, what kit did you use with the Vickers at that point? What were you carrying? And you should be well aware of the uh, Mark III aiming post, perhaps from some of our other videos, photos, that sort of thing. This is used for indirect fire. It provides a zero line. We've explained that in our Q&A videos. Um, and we said, okay, so yeah, these are always on display. Uh, we've got a lamp aiming uh, dated 1962. Okay, we are clearly they're still in use and they appear in the general purpose machine gun uh, provisional manuals as well. Yeah. Somebody came, uh, one of those National Service veterans came out and said, never recognised it, never used it, um, not with a kit. And, and, and you sort of think, okay, veteran accounts, yeah, sometimes they vary. They don't, they, why would you expect them to remember the mark of aiming post that they were used? But they were absolutely adamant. And it turns out, actually, that they were using the zero post in that role. Now, the zero post is, you, know, you normally see it, it's like this, painted black. And uh, for most of its service, that's what it did. But this, in case, actually... Uh, we found this bracket that's here, you can just see it there, this bracket that screws onto the zero post and allows you to put the aiming lamp onto the bracket without needing the aiming post. So the zero post was doing two jobs and that's what they remembered seeing. Uh, the black and white painting is something normally associated with mortars and with the longer mortar posts used with the three inch mortar. Uh, 
But again, a look at some of their photos of the 1960s plus period showed these, um, you know, these aiming posts painted in this black and white pattern. So we've replicated that, and that's normally what you see on display with the mannequin. Uh, but as I said, most people like to um, you know, have an affiliation with a mannequin, so we'll take the camera off the stand and take a, uh, a closer look at the equipment that's being worn. As always, let's start with the top. This is the Mark IV turtle shell helmet. So you know, it, it would eventually become the Mark V, but was originally the, the Mark III uh, was, the, was the shape of this. They moved the uh, chin strap position and things down further, and, and you end up with this Mark IV turtle shell helmet. Very sort of reminiscent of the Cold War. So that shape of helmet uh, saw service from 1944 through to the introduction of the Mark VI helmet in the, in the mid 1980s. Uh, we've got the, uh, the base layer here, we've got the cotton uh, drab combat smock. So no upper pockets on this, these early examples, um, you know, and, the, and the trousers are much the same, just a bit worn and, and uh, you know, a bit faded on this example. And then at the base, we've got the putties. And in this case, we've got DMS boots, uh, but no laces in them. Um, clearly a risk uh, you know, for the mannequins in here on their own. Um, no, we've probably, we've just stripped it of laces, probably used them in something else. But you can see the short putties in use there rather than the web anklets that were earlier. Um, dark blue beret of the infantry at that point, uh, worth saying that the Small Arms School Corps also used the dark blue beret prior to their um, adopting the rifle green beret that they have now or has had ever since. So for a short period, they were in dark blue, um, much to their disgust, as I talk about in, in the book. Berets and hats are a common um, theme. And then we've got the uh, solid green uh, neck scarf, the face veil uh, being used as a neck scarf there. Now, their equipment is the 1958 pattern. The 1958 pattern equipment now has a number of variants. We've tried to build this set with the green metal fittings as much as possible and the early components. So you see there that the ammunition pouch is a much straighter, it doesn't sweep back like the later varieties, and it will only hold two magazines. The later variants are slightly, thick, uh, slightly deeper, um, slightly wider, whichever way you do the dimensions, and will hold three magazines, but these only hold two, and you know, otherwise are exactly the same. But you see, these, uh, these change to black, uh, blackened metal items, and let's say we've tried to uh, maintain the early equipment as much as possible, to the point that the respirator case that is underneath everything is the early S6 respirator case as well. Uh, so let's turn that mannequin around, and we can look at the back and see what he was carrying. Now, those that are familiar with 1958 pattern webbing will notice that the yoke here doesn't have the loops uh, for the large pack to thread through. We do have a large pack for this early type equipment, but it's just not on display at the moment. Uh, you can see the web sling of the sterling there and then the web strap of the respirator case. So we have a, a webbing respirator case that was later replaced with the nylon one. Nylon would be much easier to decontaminate in the event of a chemical attack or a nuclear agent. And, um, but for the start, it was a, you know, a webbing case here, carried on the left-hand side in this case. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you'd have this, the water bottle pouch. The later water bottle pouch had a buckle rather than this quick release um, turn buckle there. And that probably, as I understand it, there were green water bottles in use and green mugs at this early stage. Uh, green plastic, but we've got a black one in there for now. Now the kidney pouches hang off a little bit because they don't have the top straps that are introduced on the later variant of the kidney pouches. So this is what replaced the small back, uh, the small pack, the haversack, uh, and would be carrying the mess tins, uh, you know, wash roll, things like that, or the combat equipment fighting order is what this is set up to be. Um, and it replaced that. You then have the large pack that would carry sleeping bag, um, spare clothing etc uh, but fighting fighting order included the kidney pouches here and like i say they only attach on the lower loops whereas later varieties pull this in tighter to and, and uh, to the yoke by attaching there as well uh, this was the equipment that i had when i was a army cadet or not this exactly I, I, these exact items but the 1958 pattern is what we were issued with um and then you have the uh poncho roll uh, at the bottom there, which would also be used as a, uh, later on certainly, a second poncho roll could be carried on the top of the nuclear biological chemical warfare equipment, the NBC suit. Uh, but in this case, we do just have the, the cape in there as well. Uh, you can see the fittings there for the shovel or pick handle uh, that would come down between here and then attach to the back of the, uh, of the bum roll there. Um, pick handle 
the head would go across here or the shovel would just um, go in that loop and then, and then sit there as well. So yeah, let's say this is completely different. We have seen, we, we do have some photos of 1958 pattern webbing being worn in the, uh, you know, by machine gunners post 1960, by those national servicemen that I talk about. So it's really interesting to be able to set up a mannequin like this. If you do have any more photos or information on post-1960 use of the Vickers, we'd really like to see it, hear it. Um, do let us know because we find an absolutely fascinating period where you've got the Vickers going out of service, um, but still, you know, the, the guys were using the eight, old machine guns. Um, bear in mind, nothing had been built since 1945, but still being able to you know, be issued brand new equipment as well. So we hope this is a good representation of that. But as always, that caveat exists that we're not uniform specialists. Um, uh, we you know, are specialists in the Vickers and hopefully this is just a general representation rather than a specific unit that we've got in this case. So thanks for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed the videos. Please do subscribe um, and get in touch with any questions or comments you may have. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like and share the video and subscribe to the channel. Please support us on Patreon if you're able to and let us know of anything you'd like to see in the future. I look forward to hearing from you.